So good evening, everyone. This is Miss Doherty and her bright pink hat talking to you tonight about Chapter 9, Covalent Bonding. Please have in front of you your yellow PowerPoint notes. We're going to start at the beginning. And the concepts we'll cover are what is covalent bonding and why do atoms do that? What's the difference between a sigma and a pi bond? How is it that atoms can have single, double, and triple bonds? And that's pretty much it for this first part of the chapter. So the first thing that we need to define is what's a covalent bond? And that's an attractive force that occurs when two or more atoms share one, two, or three pairs of electrons. So the difference between covalent bonding and ionic is there is no transfer of electrons, there's only sharing. Now why do atoms bond at all, whether ionic or covalent? Well, the first and most important reason is that they become stable. If you have seven outermost electrons and can share with another atom and fool yourself into thinking that by sharing you've gotten a full octet, eight outermost electrons, then you have become isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas. You don't really look like a noble gas, you just have the same electron configuration of the nearest noble gas. Now the exception to that, as we'll see in a moment here, is hydrogen. Hydrogen, when it shares electrons, can only have two electrons maximum, not eight. So stability is the key. Now there have been a few problems with playing the embedded videos, so I'm going to hold on this embedded video in the PowerPoint until I see you next in class. That'll be a good review for us as we go back over this podcast um, the next time we meet. Now this is a lovely picture showing the formation of a molecule. There are two carbon atoms, on the left hand side this is what we call a space filling model. On the right hand side this is probably, I don't know if I have a name for it, but the closest I can come is it's probably like a Bohr model picture of an atom and its electrons. Notice that when we color code this, originally the carbon on the left brought four electrons to the sharing party, the carbon on the right brought four, and if they overlap with each other and also overlap with a hydrogen on each of these top, bottom, left, and right, now everybody is pretty much stable. Each of the hydrogens, as they share an electron with the carbon, believes that it has two. Each of the carbons believes that it completely owns eight electrons. And so in this configuration, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven shared interfaces. And at each of the overlap of the electron clouds, you can see one shared pair of electrons caused by when the atoms overlap orbitals. So we call the basic unit of structure for covalently bonded substances a molecule. And very important, covalently bonded molecules are only made of metals bonded to other, excuse me, non-metals bonded to other non-metals. That's the difference between that and ionic bonding. Non-metal, non-metal bonding identifies a covalent or molecular substance. Now when atoms get near each other, there are both repulsive forces and attractive forces. Now here's the picture what's really happening. These fuzzy clouds show two atoms getting close to each other. Well, their electron clouds, symbolized here with a negative sign, will repel each other, like charges repel. Their center, or nuclei, will repel each other. But the nuclei of one atom is attracted to the negative electron cloud of another, and vice versa. So there are both attractive and repulsive forces between two atoms. And what atoms want to do is to get the just right distance from each other. Not so far apart that they can't bond, but not too close that they repel each other. They're trying to get a balance of those attractive and repulsive forces. Now we're starting to get into the meat of the material. When two atoms approach each other, they have a couple of ways that they can overlap. As you can see here, there's two hydrogen atoms overlapping end to end. You could have two chlorine electron clouds. These are special P, or uh, remember the double dumbbell or the dumbbell orbitals? They can overlap end to end. 
Or you can have just a spherical orbital overlapping end-to-end -end with a dumbbell orbital. When you do have overlap end-to-end, -end, we call that a sigma bond. And the sigma bond, I'll show you this again in class tomorrow because they don't have a symbol embedded here, I think. It's like a little O with a little, little tail kind of on it. So a single covalent bond, when atoms share one pair of electrons by overlapping end to end, that is called a sigma bond. Now they overlap end to end, concentrating those electrons in what we call a bonding orbital, this zone that's right here. And when you share one pair of electrons, and it, they're not really shown here because these little black dots are the, really the nuclei, but what's hidden in these darker zones are two electrons, or you can call that one pair. Again, I will do this video contrasting covalent to ionic bonding in class. Sometimes, though, atoms can share more than one pair of electrons. In fact, you can share multiple bonds or have multiple bonds. You could have one pair of electrons being shared, you could have two pairs or even three. Here's Miss Doherty putting on her purple hat. Hmm, what's she up to? So carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur can frequently form multiple bonds. And as we'll learn later on when we do um, what we call Lewis structures, You'll see why this is necessary, but for right now, it's the same driving force. They're trying to get a complete octet. I just took a breath of air, which is about 20% of what you see right here in the upper left. A molecule of oxygen gas doesn't have one pair of electrons between it. It has two. Think of the lines as each line represents two electrons. So here's one pair. Here's another pair. They have two pairs between them. Here's a picture down below in beautiful Cal colors of blue and gold. Here are the two pairs of electrons. And again, atoms don't really know which one contributed what electron, but you can pretend that these two blue electrons came from the atom of oxygen on the left and the two on the right from the oxygen on the right, or the two also in the middle from the oxygen on the right. When you count them up, you can see that each of the outermost rings has eight electrons, and of course electrons aren't color-coded. But now what we have are two pair being shared. That's called a double bond. Another deep breath. Nitrogen is the other 79 or 80 percent of the air I just breathed in. Nitrogen has three pairs of electrons bonding across the middle, or you can think of that as six electrons total. It doesn't really look like that. It looks more like that. But if I was going to draw a picture, each line represents one pair of electrons. Now the way it can do that is kind of interesting. As you saw, we can have orbitals overlap end to end. But sometimes, and we'll take a closer look at this later, if you have those dumbbell p orbitals, they can overlap side to side. So that's called a pi bond. And you can never have a pi bond all by itself. A pi bond always has to go with another sigma bond. And I'm going to show you a picture of that here in just a moment. So sigma end to end, that would make a single bond. Now we're going to look at how combinations of sigma and pi bonds can form double or triple bonds. Oh, scary picture. Kind of freaky, so don't get too flipped out over it. First thing I want you to look at is, where are all the sigma bonds? Well, remember, and don't worry about this sp2, that comes later, end-to-end -end overlap. Here's another end-to-end -end overlap. In fact, there's one, two, three, four, five places on this complex-looking molecule where there's clouds that are overlapping end-to-end. -end. So I got five sigma bonds. But what I want you to notice is, there's a place where there's a p orbital sticking up this way and one sticking up this way, and they could overlap, but side to side. Let's clean that picture up. This is a picture that shows the five sigma bonds that we were just identifying. Then here are the p orbitals and the blue, I don't know, 
that just shows the plane of the molecule in which those other bonds are happening. We just kind of cleaned it up and got the clouds out of there. Now the pi bond could form if this p orbital overlaps with that p orbital. And when they do, you get this trippy looking thing here. That's what a pi bond looks like. It kind of looks like an upside-down Mongolian saddle bonded to another right-side-up Mongolian saddle. Saddles in Mongolia don't have any stirrups or horn. So that is what we call a double bond. We can clean it up one more time. Notice there's two carbons and four hydrogens. Write this in your notes. To get a double bond, you have to have one sigma bond. That occurred right here. And you have to have a pi bond when the p orbitals overlap side to side. Don't worry too much about the shape. We won't be drawing that. That's what it looks like if you were going to draw a picture of it in something that we call a structural formula. This is C2H4 with a double bond in the middle, so we call that ethene. So the double bond that we just draw with two little lines really happened when there were overlap end-to-end -end between two electron clouds and an overlap side-to-side -side between two um, uh, p orbitals. So that's what we call a double bond. One sigma and one pi. This one gets even a little freakier, but we'll clean that out. Now it's this time that we have two carbons and two hydrogens and all those bulby looking things sticking out our electron clouds. Can you find the, the sigma bonds? There's one here, one in the middle, and one over here. There's that symbol for sigma that I was talking about earlier. So there's a sigma bond between the two center atoms. That's all we're going to focus on right now. But now you've got to get technical and watch my arms. There's two p orbitals sticking up this way that could overlap, and there's two going into the paper that could overlap this way. So you could actually have two pi bonds forming between the two carbons. So now we have a triple bond, one sigma and two pi. And here is how we symbolize it with the simple formula for ethyne. We change the ending depending upon how many bonds are between the two carbons. So those three lines represent the one sigma and two pi, and each line represents an electron pair. So the two carbons here each think they own those six electrons in the center and two more on the right. So each of the carbons thinks that it completely owns eight electrons when in fact they're really sharing. That is an excellent point for me to stop this vodcast. Now what you must do is go to Moodle and you will find a quiz labeled Covalent Bond Chapter 8 vodcast number one quiz and it's a 10 point true false quiz. You won't get anything more than one chance at answering the question so it's important that if you want to go back and double check on this podcast look at your notes have your notes handy and be able to answer the 10 hopefully straightforward vodcast questions that came directly from this podcast. Okay take care see you later.